we're back with another edition of Neo Reality Collective. We're back in the week and Okay. <laughs> okay, let's start this off. Um Yeah, so Xbox Game Studios have all their games at the Xbox Game Studio development area have been played 1.66 billion hours so far in 2020. That's 2,669 full lifetimes. Uh, okay. Uh, Xbox Game Studio titles have been pl have been played for about 1.66 billion hours this year, further proving that 2020 has been a great year for staying inside and playing video games, while reminding us of the cold, cruel, slow demise that 2020 has ruined our lives. Xbox marketing box Aaron Greenberg shared this Disney figure in a rundown on impressive stats on the Xbox Wire blog. That figure your played is only a year to date, and Greenberg confirmed that's a record for the company. And I granted it's coming with darker context. The average world life expectancy for humans is 71 years old, according to a 2015 study. Okay, maybe that should be up to date. So, yeah, so over 2,669. Average lifetimes for theoretical people who have only ever played the first party Xbox game, never started to eat, sleep, or even try Mario Kart. Technically, the math works to point ninety eight, but you know, round it up. So the last person would get to enjoy a few months of retirement after their seventy years of gaming service. Fun with the uh these play our figures are kind of the metric that you should expect to hear a lot more from the Xbox in the near future. Now that Xbox Game Pass has become a cornerstone of Marvel of Microsoft's gaming business model, it's becoming less about the number of games on console sold and more about how much the company can engage with its subscribers. Uh, with Xbox Series X and an impressive slate of upcoming Series X games on the way, hey, the number could be getting bigger as the years ahead. Um, yeah, the, the reason why I, I was laughing at this because I was like. Like, okay, granted, it's a record, but at the same time, it shouldn't really be a record. But because of this year's context, like, disasters, viruses, life pounding at us more ways than one for some reason, out of normal abundancy, it's, uh, it's reaching a point where people are now, have surpassed the human species. All is lost. All is lost. So, uh, Marvel's new Young Guns initiative has a new class and a new name. The Stormbreakers. For the past 16 years, Marvel has recognized the top and upcoming art comic artists naming them part of their Young Guns program. And now they have a new class of artists and a new name. Eight artists have been named at, at the inaugural class of Marvel Stormbreakers. So I'm like, isn't that a team name that they made, or is this just made up at the moment? So this is the next generation of elite artists in the industry. Who they are? Okay, so it so one of them is is obvious. Uh, I, he worked on Powers of Ten, so that should say something. Uh, Pat Gleason, one of the rotating artists for Amazing Spider-Man. Josh Kestra, artist of X Force. Peach Mom Momoko, the regular cover artist and subject of the 2021 book of Marvel Portfolio. Oh, RB Sylvia, upcoming artist on Fantastic Four, because, you know, Powers of X was really not important. I like it just set the stage for a ton of big events. Um, Cameron Carnerio, artist of Hellions and rotating artist on Miles Morales Spider-Man. John Cabell, one of the rotating artists of Guardians of the Galaxy. Eben Colio, Artist of the upcoming series Dark Ages and a rotating artist on Venom. Um, and and Nacha Bustos previously drew Spider Woman and Moon Girl, Girl and Devil Dinosaur. But yeah, it's mostly RB Sylvia I'm more interested in because his artwork's awesome. Like, I'm not discrediting their talents, but still, since I, you know, know more, seen more of Arby's work and Patrick Gleason, especially because. Of his Superman run as the artist on there, but yeah, it's just I, I'm glad they're getting the big attention that they can with this, uh, in light despite all the things. So I, I'm proud of them, um, and their art and their commitment to the art to the art of comic books. 
Marvel has now given a reason for the name change from the Young Guns to the Stormbreakers, but the new names follows a similar situation in superhero comics. Uh, yeah, and Stormbreaker being the weapon of of Bill, Beta Ray Bill. Again, I, I get Bill, Beta Ray Bill is an iconic character for many, but I'm I was like, like, oh no, it's just the fearsome Bill. It, it just makes me laugh a little bit. These eight artists have proven their unrivaled talent and passion for storytelling, but and much like Beta Ray Beal, they are truly worthy of taking up one of the mantles of one of Marvel Stormbreakers, the next generation of elitist elite artists. We can't wait to show you all what's next, and to all our Stormbreakers, take up your hammer. That's not as cool as saying, raise your swords! Marvel roughly outlines this class in a two-year term, which stated plans to offer the artists exclusive new opportunities across Marvel's publishing line. The previous classes of Young Us have also been, been grandfathered into the Stormbreakers program and considered honorary Stormbreakers in addition to their work with Young Guns, according to Marvel. Uh, oh, oh, they're really tempting me to say this. There's a special set of skills you need to have in order to draw comics at the highest level. If you have these particular skills, those that you've acquired over a very long and very challenging career, if you return to what is ours, Joe Quesada, that will be the end of it. But, if you don't, I will find you. And I will draw you. Yeah, yeah, I butchered that. So, uh, like the finest illustrators, you must be able to draw anything and everything at any any given moment. Have the keen storytelling eye of a, ma of a master film director. The ability to convey emotion and characters like the world's greatest performers. And the imagination of the greatest storytellers in history. But to be a Marvel comic artist, you need all of that as well as the ability to make your character and story jump off the page. They need to be larger than life, yet grounded enough that we see... All see ourselves within them. We're thrilled to bring together the Stormbreakers, a team of super up-and-coming artists who will continue that legacy. So when I heard the whole, they need to be larger than life, yet grounded enough that we all see ourselves within them, I'm thinking, oh, so the way WWE should start making their talent, but refuse because John Cena, and Rock, and Punk, and Hogan. Because they had... Wrong too big. Uh, yeah, but these are a very talented artists. Patrick Gleason and uh, R.B. Sylvia, especially. Aftershock Comics announces merger with TV Film Company. After five years, Aftershock makes plans to expand more into the TV and film industry. So they tend to merge with a TV film distribution company with a new umbrella name for the combined entity, Aftershock Media. The company has had TV and film development since its inception in 2015, but this merger with the distribution company, Rai Rivgachi, he will allow this new combined company to better leverage Aftershock's comic book properties and more in the TV, film, and gaming and podcast. Has, Rai Gachi has been around since 1994 and is best known for distributing reality TV shows, Dog Whisper with Caesar Millen, Homicide Hunter, and Something's Killing Me. Aftershock has been connected to Rive since its foundation in 2015. As Rive's CEO, John Kramer, er, was one of the comic book publisher founders and has served as CEO there as well. As part of this business relationship, Rive who usually negotiated TV and film deals for the Aftershock comic book series, The Kaiju Score and Undone by Blood. Today is a milestone for both. Of two companies I've had the pleasure of building alongside amazing visionaries, colleagues, and collaborators. The significance of this serendipity Strategic Union cannot be understated because of our because of our groundbreaking diverse comic IP will now have a team to support and drive its growth into TV, film, gaming, and podcasts fueled by this development, production, and distribution of script both scripted edited and unscripted content. Rive got Rive and I were looking for a way to re-enter the scripted space because we saw us saw insustainable appetite with the proliferation of channels. So Aftershock's comics will now be a division of the Umbrella Media Company that is its namesake alongside Division for Film on TV. Currently, the staff and comics dis division will remain the same, led by editor-in-chief Mike Martz, Arts and CCO publisher Joe... I can't pronounce his name. So, uh, I don't read any of the Aftershock comics. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, 
I don't read them, so so I don't really know much details about the company. I, I've heard of the company's name, but just just that that that's it. That that's all I have of knowledge of them. And they have been working, so it would be interesting to see where they take this stuff. I mean, like they probably will get their comics more out there than the Young Blood movies that were being in development for God knows how many years. Uh so the PlayStation 5 hands-on confirms cooling fans remain silent even after extended use. Recent PS5 previews have suggested that silence fans are even more impressive than its loading times. And that's just depressing. Like, but really? The fans being super, super quiet are better or even more impressive than the loading times of the games? I mean... Shouldn't that be both a good yet bad thing at the same time? Because now it's like you, you just said that, oh, these fans are more impressive than, than the eternal architecture of the console itself. It, it's telling, isn't it? Uh, well, let's hope that doesn't say, doesn't say anything in the long run. Godfall is not a service game, but does require an internet connection to play. So they try to say it's not a live service and whatnot in a tweet. Thing someone named someone on Twitter asked, Are we sure it's not online? Because here's the official listing PlayStation saying it requires online play. Godfall tweeted out yesterday, Godfall to a few days ago, Godfall is not a service game but does require an internet connection to play. And yeah, fans and so with some fans saying that any game that requires an always on connection is indeed a live service game. While I was saying they will no longer be picking up the game when it launches next month, so. Yeah, it's bad all around on that. Like I, I don't like I, I played some life services games. I don't really stick around all that much. So yeah, and every time I hear the word life service and how it is, I'm thinking, well, why not just make it an MMO? Just make it a free to play MMO and use the microtransactions for that to justify it. But no, it, it's not, even though it acts like it. <laughs> oh man. Uh I don't know if I'll be getting Godfall, I really don't know. So, movie, movie theater stocks plummet following Regal closure. No time to, to die delay. Okay, so according to the airline, Cinemark fell the, fell the most stateside, ending the day at $8.33 at a 17.44% 17 decline. EMC Entertainment fell with an 11% and closing at $4.13. Marcus dropped at 6.2. National Cinemedia, 8. 8.54 while IMAX only dropped slipped by 1.86. Cineworld, the parent company, their Regal Films, which is traded in London, fell 50%. Yeah, this is further hinting that the film and that the theater industry side of things is pretty much dying on arrival. That I, I'm sorry about that. It sucks. I really get it. Um so in Whatever you could call this weird is Robert Downey Jr. wants to create a themed cinematic universe based around Sherlock Holmes or a theme around it. So, yeah, speaking at Fast Company's Innovation Festival, Robert Downey Jr., his wife producing partner Susan, laid out their vision for their mystery verse, which would include movies and TV shows. At this point, we really feel that there is not a mystery verse built out anywhere, and Conan Dolly is, is the definitive voice in that area, I think, to this day. So to me, why do a third movie if you're not going to be able to spin it off in some real gems of diversity and other times elements? We think there's an opportunity to build it out more. Spin off characters from a third movie to see what's going on in the TV landscape. I need to see what Warner Brothers is starting to build out with things like HBO and HBO Max. Robert Downey Jr. is saying he's not looking to copy the MCU, which began with his titular role as Iron Man and, uh, and or HBO's other mystery franchise, Perry Manson. We're not repeaters. We don't just do what's been done somewhere else. But I think there's a model itself has become much more dimensionalized than it was before. So, it also the article goes on to mention how that does not mean that Downey's are not planning on learning from the those that came before them. The two watched Josh Whedon and Kevin Feige build the MCU over ten years and hopes to build on their success. I do think that the de decade of tutelage and observation, what we were both able to have with Marvel, watching them build and see all the opportunities was invaluable. It was like a master class, Susan said, and they really didn't know what they were doing, and they had this tight-knit grip of people 
Well, from t from the jump locked into a vision. Well, except for Edward Norton, and we all know how that worked out. What I saw was very humble beginnings, very uncertain outcomes, a lot of creative risk taking, but there was also an algorithm to potential. Downey Jr. said, "A Sherlock Holmes universe would be the latest attempt by a studio to build a cinematic universe." Aside from the MCU, the most successful version is the DCU, but those films have received mixed reviews, and the team film was considered a commercial and critical failure, and whatnot. that. Uh, cinematic universes include Legendary Entertainment's Monsterverse and the failed Dark Universe, which would have included Dracula, Frankenstein, and The Mummy. There are no currently plans for any project in the world of Sherlock Holmes beyond Sherlock Holmes 3 development, so <clears throat> we'll have to see where this goes, but I, I was thinking when I saw this, it's like... We're, oh god some people like to make the argument that the shared universe stuff for movies is kind of reaching a fatigue point i'm not 100 certain on that but like i get the feeling the reason why people say this a fatigue of swords is because there's been more failed universes than more successes like outside of the dceu was trudged along despite the numerous way downs and now you got the snyder cut coming out but Look at it from another point. Um, beyond just the DCU films, what other shit franchise has succeeded besides MCU? And some of you have just said Arrowverse, probably. And one could make the argument the X-Men, but then considering how their later years kind of fell apart. Yeah, not that many. Like, the Dark Universe fell apart after one movie. Monsterverse, I, I kind of forgot that was even a thing. So... It's it's really hard to tell regarding regarding this. And, and there is one big piece of, of Cinematic Universe news, but uh, I'll get to that. Even I'm still baffled by it. Cinemark has no plans to reshutter theaters. Despite Regal Cinemas announcing the shutdown of their U.S. location, Cinemark says they will keep their theaters open. And so, okay, I'm just going to say bulls. No, 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 no. Close it. No, you have to give up at this point. Like, there is no... Like... Like, they have been getting positive responses to the chain's new health and safety procedures. There is, and the chain's hours of operation have been cut. However, according to the analysis, there could be further paradigm down in the weeks to come. So, yeah, once again, we're, we're, we're in this crisis mode where Cinemark and everything else is kind of struggling... With, with with the movies being delayed and all that, leading to what should have been the biggest year for them to be the lowest of the lows, especially with what happened with Dune, and I'll get to that. But uh, uh, speaking of movies, Joker's producer uh, Michael E. Ilson suggested Mister Freeze should be the next DC villain to really receive the live action treatment. During a virtual appearance at Wizard World, Batman to Joker panel, well, he mentioned that the, the method director Todd Phillips used for making Joker could be used to tell stories of other DC villains. Mr. Freeze would be his choice to star in, the sim in a similar film. One of my favorite episodes of the Batman anime series, which I love, absolutely love, dealt with Mr. Freeze and the loss of his wife. The ep ep empathy, the emotions that, the, that, that created, I could see making a movie. So, so refer referring to the origin story of Mr. Freeze and the tragedy around that character and, and why you also root for him while you don't like what he's doing you also root for him considering that he's trying to you know save his um save his wife so yeah it it, it makes sense for the idea of having a shared unit having joe having mr freeze play I mean, get his own kind of movie with the joker kind of thing but at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, of like it, it, like I, like, like I'm pretty sure people, the mainstream audience, still remember the, the first time he was adapted to film. In fact, now that I think about it, I think there's never been another live action version of him since that particular character. I, uh, you know who I'm talking about, Full Party. Josh Brolin then goes goes into an interview recently and discusses his role as Thanos and explains why he eventually agreed to play the Mad Titan. 
So Brolin appeared in a guest says on the event, Team Deacons podcast where he was asked about his decision to join the Avengers movie. Brolin explains that if he had been approached to play one of the heroes, he probably would have said no. He also didn't anticipate that his appearance would be anything more than a cameo. When I said yes to Avengers, it was a small thing. It was basically a cameo. So there wasn't a lot of money involved, so that wasn't the reason. If the role had been one of the Avengers, I probably wouldn't have done it. Roland was not particularly interested in being one of Earth's mightiest heroes. He had already turned down several offers for joining the MCU before he was offered the role of Thanos. Being a villain, however, offers a whole new world of creative possibility. The fact that it was all of the Avengers against this one guy, I like the aspect of it. Roland also explained that he liked the creative freedom he had while playing for Thanos more than he had for his character Cable in Deadpool 2, even with all the special effects involved in creative Thanos for the big screen. Roland was able to develop a certain depth to the infamous villain and even drew parallels to Marlon Brando as Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now. Okay, I wasn't even thinking that, but let's go with that logic. Sadly, I had all this stuff in me before we started shooting dots and all that. I put my elbow on my knee and my hand up there and I scratched and then I then they had the crude rendition of it, Brolin said. So the more I watched that, the more I realized, oh, this is like a real guy. This is not a big purple guy. This is a guy with insights and cells and feelings. Then it became fun. So... Yeah, and Brolin's set to be in Doom, based on the novel by Frank Herbert and directed by Dennis, I'm not pronouncing his name, but I'll just say the director of Arrival and, and Blade Runner, the sequel. But, um, yeah, as we continue getting more MCU talk, um, Jamie Foxx spoiled one major thing about Electro's eventual MCU debate. So... While it hasn't begun production at all, and it could change by the time this thing. Um, so, it, Fox went on an Instagram post, which has now been deleted, that teased that there is a big difference with his character. Electro in the movie, in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, was blue. So, I'm pretty sure Angry Joe's out there somewhere praising the movie God for saying, Not acting blue! Thank you, man. Thank you, OJ. And all that. But he did say on to went on to say this that no, he won't be blue, but he will be badass. So yeah, it seems like this is a this, so if this if this is building towards the Spider-Verse live action version, and I hope it is, uh imagine if Jamie Foxx met his other self, except that one's all blue. Like yeah, it, it, and they deleted it, so clearly that wasn't supposed to be said. But we cut back to more cinematic universe talk. Okay, this is the part where people should be telling movie crit move the critics and fans who don't like it should be telling them this. But give up. Why are they so obsessed with Doctor Seuss's creations? Like. So, they want to start something in 2024. A Dr. Seuss cinematic universe. According to Vanity Fair, Warner Animation Group is set to bring the three books from the world of Dr. Seuss to the big screen. The Cat in the Hat, The Thing 1 and Thing 2, and all the places you'll go. Although the films aren't set to release until 2024, or they already listed big name directors and producers, including... Including J.J. Abrams, Bad Robots, Hannah Mengele, South Park's Erica whatever, and Disney's Art Hernandez. So... Okay, um... So this Dr. Seuss Enterprise President Susan Brandit said this, For the first time, we're not just doing one film for one book. We're going to do a franchise build beyond the initial story of these books and find out what happens next. I call it stretching the fabric. How far can it go to go a little bit deeper with our characters? Seuss build worlds. There are so many questions that he posts, which is why you can read and reread those stories. It's been exciting for us to think that they about it as world building and not just a single story. So the first film, Cat in the, Hat, the Cat in the Hat, directed by, er, I can't pronounce their name, and Disney story artist Art Hernandez, the movie will feature the original Dr. Seuss story of, the, of a cat that shows up to the home with two children and while their mother's away. 
This will be followed by the tentatively titled The Thing 1 and Thing 2 in 2026. Although the film does not have a production team yet, it has more leeway in terms of plot since it will be truly original story. The last announced film will be... All the Places You'll Go will feature the last Dr. Seuss book published during the author's lifetime and is set to for a 2027 release. Produced by Abrams and whatnot and Bad Robot. The movie will follow the story of a boy in pajamas that sets off to see what the world has to offer. The film within the Seuss universe that will, will not link together through the storyline or characters instead the movies will be connected by Dr. Seuss' iconic style and theme. And the cat and hat will not meet the boy in All the Places You'll Go, nor would the things go visit the Lorax. While they all feel like part of the Seuss universe, they live in their worlds and they're not necessarily going to interact with the same films. So it's not a shared universe. It, it can't be a shared universe. It's just a franchise that just have these characters. So why, why try it? I mean... <sighs> why do they keep... Why does Hollywood try? with this why do they try so hard to stretch out a simple children's book to an over explosive two to three hour movie it, i'm like I, I don't get it like i'm not saying that they can't do it but like if they don't have the passion for it or you know they're just trying to make money out of it and that's it it and they can't make meaningful content like like Dr. Seuss's Cat in the Hat movie. I ref in fact, let me just cut out Dr. Seuss's name because that was a complete travesty. <laughs> At least the Grinch, to some extent, had something with it. Like the actor was great, the the costume effect was great, but then the Cat in the Hat happened, and then I was like, oh god. Like the like even when I was a kid, I was like, okay. That, I even when I was a kid, like while I was a kid and I was just a kid, even I was like, why is his face like that? Like like it's a cut in. Like he just put his head through a cut hole, hole to you know, walk around in. Like, but but why is it trying to be a universe? Like in fact, way I've been interesting to have them interact with one another but at the same time it's like they, they can't really make a they really can't make a uh a, a cinematic event where they have all these characters meet like that that's just stupid it's not the avengers it's not the dceu it's not original projects Heck, at least the dark universe would have had something like they had crossovers during the original days of the universal studio projects so, just let this end. So, <sighs> so HBO's Game of Thrones prequel cast is Viserys Viserys Targaryen, Patty Con Condensine. I I'm pretty sure I pronounced that wrong has joined the Game of Thrones prequel series House of Dragons as King Tar Tarragon, ancestor of Daenerys, the Outsiders character, the Outsiders actor that will play the ancestor of Daenerys, according to Deadline and whatnot, who was chosen by the Lord of Westeros to take over for the old king, king at the Great Council of uh, whatevers, described as a warm and decent man. He only wishes to carry forward his grandfather's legacy, but good men do not actually make for great kings, as the character is being described. So, yeah, House of Dragon was ordered on 2019 of October. The series will be based on George R. R. Martin's Fire and Blood, a compilation of stories and historical records related to the House of Targaryen. And the genre will consist of 10 episodes and received a straight to series order. The order spinoff is created by Martin and Ryan Cornell, over at Cornell and Michael's whatever last name, serving as co showrunners. There's the two will serve as executive producers alongside Martin and Vincent, whatever. And it's also set to direct multiple episodes, including the pilot. Uh, created by George R. R. Martin and Ryan Cardinal, Old House of Dragons stars, well, that part actor, Patty Con Constein, and is expected to premiere on HBO and HBO Max in 2022, provided we don't have any disasters within the next year or so. So, I never finished Game of Thrones. I do know how it ended, and it confuses me because then I was like, um, so, 
Bell set her off to mass murder. Like, I, I'm still confused by that. Like, I was thinking, like, okay, this could just be me being dumb and not knowing how the show completely went. But, like, how does the, the tower that rings the surrender signal indicate that she is triggered to just go on a murder spree? Like, I get it, they built up the idea that there's something significant to that tower, like it symbolizes something she hates, or symbolizes a curse in her family name, or something like that. But no, there, there was no indication that that was the case when I looked into it, as far as I know. So, yeah, I, I still, so yeah. Like, considering how we know how the universe TV side show ends, it doesn't really give people motivation, I think, to tune in, other than it's a prequel series, but we all know how this ends. So, something big is going to happen. So, The Mandalorian Disney Plus finally confirms Rosie O'Donson and Timothy Alfred for season two during a Instagram story confirming her confirming Rosie O'Donson for the for the role and while it hasn't confirmed who the character is uh it does tie in with rumors and also her desire to be in a Star Wars series or movie where she plays a live action version of Ahsoka so yeah So yeah, and while and a, re, a list did come out, uh, according to the Writers Guild of America database, posed a list to its directory, which features series creator John Ferrara writing writing the um, majority of the episode season. Star Wars Clone Wars showrun the Clone Wars showrunner Dave Filoni will pen episode five, so we must tune into episode five to see what happens to see if Ahsoka shows up in there, and Rick will write episode seven. Yeah, so season two could feature Rose O'Donson playing Ahsoka and Tamaru Morrison playing Boba Fett because he's coming back. Um, and considering one episode in in season two is dubbed The Sorcerer, I'm pretty sure we know where that's going, so it's gonna be interesting. I'm pretty sure this is part of the search for Ezra thing, but. I'm pretty certain we're gonna get Ahsoka, so I'm gonna be excited for that. Also, Sasha Banks is there, and she's a and she is apparently probably a Jedi. I don't think she's Sabine, but we'll see. We'll definitely see. Horror game, Madam uh, Mundown, coming to PS5 and Xbox Series X. More details revealed. A horror game with hand-drawn visuals and a unique fear system is coming to next gen. Developer Hidden Fields has been working on the game since 2015, and it's finally revealed its release date. Eight. Quarter one of 2021. The game, a horror experience set in Swiss Alps, is inspired by designer Michael, whatever his last name is, on experiences holidaying in the Alps as a child. At least some of the dialogue will be recorded in Romanish. Romanish. This language is exclusive for a very specific region of the Alps and spoken by only 44,000 people as of 2017. And the game is aiming for an authentic. Authenticity, an example which is given as an in-game art studio you explore, which was modeled after a real house used by an artist in the region during the 50s. The trailer was published and everything. Players will have a journal which keeps track of objectives and puzzle clues, and the game will blend realism with the supernatural. Solving these puzzles is essential to progress. Players will also need to avoid hostile forces on the mountain. There's no combat, so you need to outsmart your enemies to avoid them. So it's also coming to PC, Switch, PS4, and Xbox One alongside these next gens. Specific differences between these different versions have not been specified or announced yet. So, uh, okay, I, I don't know much about this game, but it does sound kind of cool that, like, this is a horror game that you really don't have a combat thing. You have to avoid, you have to hide, and you're practically defenseless. So, yeah, it is kind of cool. I do see that's kind of a cool idea. Uh, but the, the aim for authenticity, like, let's just hope it doesn't go for obsession to detail. It's, and just be down to detail, but not obsessed, obsessed like Red Dead Redemption 2 was, and we all know how that worked out. But yeah, uh, pretty crazy idea. Like, I'm looking forward to it. Let's see how that goes out. So, sorry. 
After a rocky few years, Starbreeze pay, Payday 3 is being worked on again, but it won't be out soon. So Payday 3, which is the sequel, was first announced back, back in 2016 and is still in the works. There was reason to believe the game might have been quietly canceled amid issues faced by publisher and developer Starbreeze, but it seems that is not the case. So they faced some financial hardships and their offices raided following accusations of inside trading. The gaming, the company's Walking Dead game underperformed. Production on Payday began in 2017, but Starbreeze was public about its struggles and the difficulty it faced in keeping the company running. And so in late 2019, developer announced that they would work would that work would continue in Payday 2 and attempt to recoup some of the money. And earlier this year, the publisher said that the game was still earning money despite releasing back in 2013. So yeah, um, a tweet came out which uh, on Payday 2's official account saying this: "Access Payday Twitter man member count 100,000 request received accessing crime net crime net connecting online time 1337 lead status Payday 3 confirmed check design phase check release date to be announced check Unreal Engine check so." <laughs> Yeah, it's not canceled. It's still being worked on. We'll probably get more news about it next year, but I don't think it's going to come out anytime soon. But uh, yeah, we, we get the next big piece of news saying 2020 has been the devil's year. Dune has been delayed. It was coming out to December of this year. It's now been delayed for next year. Okay, okay, that, that's okay. Like, we get it. The virus has ruined all our lives, and we can't go to really go to theaters without risking it. So, uh, how far along is this delay? Like, it can't be that long. It could be, like, a couple of months at best. It's practically a whole year. It's set to release October 1st, 2021. No! But there is a bit of a twist to this. So if you see my ticker at the bottom, uh, you'll notice I made a little joke in the t in the ticker. Uh, Dune v. Batman, Dawn of the Theater, Dawn of Theaters, because uh, that's the same release date as The Batman by Matt Reeves and Robert pa Patterson. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, Fast and Furious got pushed back because of conflicts with the now delayed No Time to Die by James Bond. And yeah, so if if, it, if the both both movies come out, they're gonna have the biggest movie battle in history. An adaptation of Dune for like the second time in theaters. There's and an adaptation of the Batman for like let's see, uh there was one back in the 30s, and if you count the TV shows as well, that's like, what, like, 10 times they've done this? Like, let, let's see, uh, they did did the Adam West Batman movie, it, not Adam West one, uh, an old one before Adam West, I think. Uh, I, I don't remember much of the details about that, but uh, moving on from that, there was the Michael Keaton Batman, there was... The three Batman movies, the Joel Schumacher Batman movies. There was Batman, the Phantasm character movie. Uh, that and also, oh, uh, there was also, uh, there was also the Dark Knight trilogy. Then there's the Justice League. There's the Batman v Superman movie. There's the Justice League movie. So what? Like four, six, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and essentially eleven. There's been eleven movie adaptations, and only and half of them came out within a short span of two decades. Yeah, we kind of have a problem with Batman. Like, even Superman didn't have that much. Like, he had four movies. Superman Returns. Man of Steel. Superman v. Batman. Batman v. Superman. Justice League. 
and that's it. But like for mainline Superman movies, like it's pretty half of it at least. So yeah, so if movie theaters somehow survive to next year, we're expecting the ultimate battle. Well, Batman v Dune Dawn of Theaters. It will be the biggest money making day in history. It's then Skyrim and uh Call of Duty came out the same week same day. Or at least the same week. So yeah. So uh, who will will Robert Pass and Batman beat the crap out of out of the Dune movie, or will Dune show no fear for the mind killer and whatnot, and 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 supremely rise to the top of the box office if we make it that far, provided the world doesn't explode yet. I'm like we unearthed a mummy at this. We unearthed a mummy. I'm pretty sure we unleashed a curse upon us. So really, I don't think we're gonna survive. Microsoft boasts about Xbox's big year ahead of the Series X and S. Microsoft's Aaron Greenberg has shared some stats about this year's biggest game studio's games as the Xbox One winds down. And I already told you what one of them is. So they shot off some statistics, it seems, and... And the company set a new record for first party games with 15 games of the studio launching this year, 10 of which were entirely new. He also boasted about the... 1.6666 billion hours. Greenberg also gave a few notes of particular games Microsoft Flight Simulator and Or and the Will of the Wisps. Both received 90 plus ratings on GameSpot's sister site Metacritic, and Wasteland 3 came in not far behind with an 86 and won Best RPG at Gamescom. Granted, it has hit one more mil more than 1 million players, while Sea of Thieves has surpassed 15 million to date. Finally, the company shared a few fun stats about the game, about as big a game. Microsoft Life Simulator, I don't know how that happened. And more than a billion miles flown, which is 50 times the number of actual daily flights taken in 2019. So that's saying something. Microsoft Dungeon has received, has had 6.9 million multiplayer sessions in the last two months. And two a third of those were couch co-op, as grounded players have squashed 500 million creepy crawlers, but they only represent a tiny fraction of estimated insects in the whole real world. Of course, the new generation is backwards compatible with the old one, and so all these games, except Light Simulator, which is PC only for now, will run even better on the Xbox Series X and S, X and whatnot, so... Yeah, I, I get what they're trying to say. They want to boast about how awesome their systems are and everything and how awesome their games are. But at the same time, you, you gotta imagine, the number probably would have been slightly, if not more, lowered. Slightly at best, lowered at worst. Very lowered at worst. Um, had, you know, we had not the pand pandemic, social distancing protocols, lockdowns, and no one had nothing else to do other than work on stuff online and most of that also required the internet so we would be distracted playing these video games so i, I get what they're trying to do but at the same time it's like oh god <laughs> oh um so despite having been renewed for a fourth and final season and one of the big factors in AEW's awesome con disappearing for now oh god covid19 has taken another powerful victim Netflix's glow! Tragic. Uh, yeah, so despite being renewed for a fourth and final season, the show has been officially canceled. So according to Deadline, Glow was about three weeks into filming its fourth season when production was suspended in mid-March. At the time of the shutdown, Glow only completed one episode. Mark Marin came on Twitter and said, No more Glow. Sorry, Stains. Glow series creators said in a statement and to deadline the seriousness of the virus and how it should be, be their priority. COVID also took down our show. Netflix has decided not to finish filming the final season. We were handed the creative, created, needed the creative freedom to make a complicated comedy about women and tell their stories and wrestle. And now that's gone. That's a lot of things happening in the world that's so much bigger than this right now. But it still sucks that we don't get to see the 15 women in, in a frame together again. We'll miss our cast of weirdo clowns and our heroic crew. It, all, it was the best job. Register to vote and please vote. So, yeah, it joins the the Altered Carbon, the Chilling Adventures of Siberian, and the Dark Crystal series thing. Dang, the, the... Oh, God. Netflix. Oh, God. Netflix. Wow. 
And, and I refuse to acknowledge that other thing they published that was messed up. But yeah, Glow, I didn't watch it. I heard a lot of positive stuff. Awesome Kong was left to do the final season. But then coronavirus shocked suck the life out of it man i'm pretty sure I'll, now we're gonna have to wait for eight million wait now i'm pretty sure they're gonna change that thing since now eight million ways to die could be considered ill contextual considering what happens but big news in about basically tw two hours at the time of this video's production or at least until tomorrow uh call of duty black ops cold war beta pre-learning starts tuesday Pre-ordering Call of Duty Black Ops 4 gets you PS4 early access to the beta. So, so yeah, um, an official time will pre-order when the preloading will be available was not disclosed. It also is unclear if preloading the beta is an option for everyone or only those who pre-order on PS4. In either case, the first beta period and start runs from October 9th, 8th to 9th for the PS4 pre-orders. Then from October 10th to 12th, Cold War beta opens for all PS4 users. Then from October 15th to 16th, PC and Xbox One users who pre-order Black Ops Cold War and all PS4 players will get access to the beta. Meanwhile, the beta will open for everyone starting on October 17th to 19th. So essentially, this starts on the 8th and ends on the 19th. And they also shared a trailer and everything. So, yeah, uh, exciting, exciting. I think I'm probably not going to play it because I'm just not interested. But, uh, uh, man, uh, it's just, I'm so desensitized with Call of Duty. Like, I played the campaign for the last Modern Warfare game they released, but then I just stopped. I just wasn't interested anymore after I finished the campaign and everything. But, yeah. Do not care whatsoever. So. <sighs> so Call of Duty Modern Warfare doesn't fit on a single 250 gigabyte SSD drive anymore. As the game continues to grow, Modern Warfare in its entirety won't fit on the drive size you may use for your entire operating system. So remember when the game launched? It was at 175 gigabytes recommended installation size was surprising for many and has since grown beyond the capabilities of an entire operating software solid state drive. So they cannot fit that into one 250 solid state drive, which prevents you from updating the game, prevents you from updating the game if you somehow decide to dedicate an entire drive just for one game. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, why? Why is this so bloated? Like, like I would think open world games with vast life and quality and whatnot would be this big. At least then I would get it. But this is a shooting game. I don't get it. I don't get it. I, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. Like, I, I don't see the reason for it. I, I generally don't. It, it's just so bloated. I'm like, this is probably going to make people turn away more because they were like, well, I got to preserve my console space. So I might as well just not play it. Or or PC space because it, because you don't have that choice to pick and choose and everything. So Sony is making big PS5 change in Japan. They're swapping the circle and X button functions. The systems you are. So, um, where's my PS4 controller at least? Now oh, it's all the way on the other side of the room. Never mind. So yeah, they're, they're, so compare, not like the Western release. Um, the, PlayStation 5 will use the X button to confirm by default for all regions, including Japan, who previously used the O button and to confirm for the past 26 years. Muscle memory and frustration for nearly 10 million PS users in Japan coming up. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's going to piss someone off. Oh, dear. 
And like for America and the rest of the world, we're perfectly fine. Japan, they're probably screwed. So Cyberpunk 2077 has gone gold. It just came at the cost of everyone's mental <laughs> Oh man. Um Cyberpunk has reached a production milestone. CJ Project Red had announced that the game has gone gold. The studio took on Twitter to mark this occasion with a promo image of showing Keanu Reeves' character, Johnny Silverhand, holding a gold cyberpunk disc. Golding, going gold in, in, is an industry term to describe finalizing and certifying the game's code that is possessed, that's pressed to retail disc. It usually comes shortly before the game's release date to allow for production time, but it signifies that the official work of the base game is complete. The work doesn't end there, though, as main modern games also come with day one patches that may squash some remain bugs and, or add quality of life fixes and tweaks. Gold Gold also makes the possibility of a net delay pretty low, given that it's already been delayed several times. So, yeah, uh... This still, they still said that these last six weeks will be the final sprint of the project and whatnot. So, yeah, the crunch period, sadly, will be the day one patch specifically. I don't know how big the day one patch is, but if it's crunching everyone and it's forcing, forcing all these problems, I'm pretty sure that's a sign of that. We have failed! So... EA teases a new Need for Speed re Hot Pursuit Remaster announcement. So, e Need for Speed went on Twitter and said, Big Joe has to be messing with me. Not sure how he found out so much effort just to tease me, so and I only wanted some pizza. Selling this car from Need for Speed. And then Need for Speed posted in that series of tweets saying, They're really onto me. How much time did it take for them to get chased by 10 cops on Heat 5? This has to be on purpose. And then they show an Eyes Wide tweet, which shows more pictures of Need for Speed. So, yeah, it looks like Need for Speed Hot Pursuit's game remastered, according to Boxar that got leaked. Eight and been rated some places. So, yeah, get ready for Need for Speed and all the chaos that comes with it. I, I've never, I don't recall playing the games, but um, <laughs> yeah. Henry Cavill once again talks about Justice Justice League versus Snyder League. So in the marketing for the original Justice League, Cavill had to keep the world's most obvious secret. So this is what Henry Cavill said in an interview with Empire Podcast for the release of regarding Eleanor Holmes and reflected his role in Justice League as picked up by Chi-Chi. The issue was that Kennedy Civil Superman had been killed off by the end of the previous film, and while his return for Justice League was basically inevitable, he says the marketing of the film still felt like it needed to treat it as a secret. It was one of those weird situations where I guess no one really knew what they wanted. It was like, hey, we need Henry on a press tour, but let's not tell anyone he's in the movie. I was like, okay, well, it's not going to be super awkward. It's going to be super awkward for me, guys. Thank you for giving me the impossible scenario. I'm just going to say to people, well, yeah, I'm here for moral support. I made the tea, and I made the tea for an entire movie. I'm pretty sure that no one bought it. I mean, kind of freaking obvious. Like, it would have been actually interesting, actually, if the Justice League formed without Superman. And, and Superman didn't return until a later... Superman movie, so it, it would be actually more interesting now that I think about it. Like, imagine it. The, the Justice League forms in honor of Superman, but not necessarily with Superman. That actually... Actually, now that I think about it, that would have actually been a unique take. Like, yeah, I know there's a DC multiverse and all that, but like, that also could have been a risky, unique take to make. Like, imagine it. Building a film off of only Wonder Woman and Batman and not the Trinity because one's dead before it happens and the League forms without Superman. Like, that would have been actually kind of interesting. They, they would have to either find a new person or they would have to save the world themselves and think they have the best confidence in themselves, but Clark's dead, so their most powerful asset's gone. But... And then I think about that would have actually been interesting. Huh. So James Tyrion the Fourth uh, said in an interview regarding bat regarding which basically hints at five G's eventual plan. Um, so James Tyrion the Fourth came out and did confirm one aspect of the five G story. That he was never meant to stay on after issue 100 out, coming out this week. So, 
this is what he said. I'm just going to confirm something that's basically common knowledge at the point. There is another universe where Batman 100 was going to be my last issue on Batman. Ask me in five to ten years and I'll tell you what my original plans were. The key moments for this year was basically I need to throw out my roadmap because the very major top-down story priority shifted. Weirdly, the shifting priorities helped me find the spirit of the book. There were entire issues I was writing out, out of order because of the necessities of double shift. Not knowing the ending of the story I was telling, I had to throw out my bag of tricks and focus on making every single individual issue an absolute blast to read. Focus on delivering a series of big cool moments and exciting character combos to make sure that there was something in each issue that made the, that issue worth reading. I knew there were big elements that I couldn't control, so I latched onto what I could control. I'd never been able to, able to before. Punchline success showed me the hunger for key new characters in Gotham's mythos. The fact that Joker War ending was up in the air meant that I could... Joker Wars ending was up in the rear meant that I could rework some key elements to fast track the introduction of Clown Hunter, and when the book became the sales juggernaut, and I was given the official news that I would be staying on the title indefinitely, I was able to reshape Joker War into an engine through, through, which, I, through which I could create new exciting status quo for Batman for 2021 and beyond. He also dropped a few other teases for, this, for the years ahead. While Batgirl has been cancelled, Barbara Gore taking on, on an Oracle role in Batman 100, because Sandra Cain seems to be looking more like Batgirl in Joker War Zone. Tyrion confirmed one key element is that I can say Barbara is going to be absolutely a central character for the rest of this year, here and next year. And if you've been missing Oracle in the Batverse like I have, I think you're going to be very excited where the things go from here. And he also talked about Punchline. The Punchline Code of 100 sets up one key of the key elements I've been dying to get to with the character of Punchline. He's about to go on trial and that trial is going to let her manipulate the whole city into loving her while she builds a dangerous plan that will run through the back burner of 2021. As for Batman 100, how it was transformed, it is not the ending, but the beginning. So, there's been no update regarding Poison Ivy, who's now Queen Ivy, and I still don't know where the ending's gonna go, because originally the plan clearly was gonna be that Batman or someone kills the Joker. I don't know if the Joker's still gonna die heading into Batman 100. Going to be interested. We'll see, but... Yeah, it's going to be interesting where they take this, but I, I don't know if um, if if the Joker is going to still die at the end of 100. They, they keep alluding to it. Harley Quinn wants it, but they haven't really said it. If, if it's really going to happen, or if that was one of the plans, but then they scrapped it because 5G was cancelled. So don't worry, Joker War story will be talked about in the Thought series, so... Yeah, right. Look forward to that. So there's been an update on contracts for the WWE for NXT call-ups. Finally. So Fightful Select reported this. We reported last week that several of the NXT calls were finally being spoken to about new contracts with WWE. This was in line with what they were told when they were brought up, that, that the times were uncertain and eventually they negotiated on new main roster deals. As mentioned, the money wasn't quite up to what they what with what a lot of wrestlers were being offered to resign last year. But then they told se those of so those involved that they reopen that they're open to renegotiating after WrestleMania season next year. So, yeah, here's the thing: this crisis probably okay. So I get the, the COVID nineteen virus fucked up a lot of things and would have probably made them Black Wednesday much worse if they did it. But at the same time, it's like, didn't you promise your NXT guys and gals when NXT was going to USA that you promised them you would get full pay for the main roster money? And that never happened. To this day, that was reported. No update ever been made for that. But they're talking about call-ups who were still getting NXT paycheck paychecks. So it's like... It's like... Oh, okay. So it's like trying to figure out basically that oh we're now finally addressing it but we're not really addressing it till next year and i get why 2020 no one predicted 2020 happening i'm mean, like if you want to make a conspiracy that vince had a possible possibility but because his best friend's in the white house and his wife works for him but um yeah um ben carter who had recently showed up on AEW's special episode Ben Carter revealed that he worked for AEW for free because of visa status and talks Britt Baker and everything else. And if you were fightful, Brian, Ben Carter 
Carter revealed that recently that Dr. Britt Baker, who is a dentist, by the way, you must remember that because, of course, was responsible for bringing his name to Tony Khan's attention. Baker was also, has also been credited publicly for getting Kyle, Kylie Ray and Wardlow into AEW and was flattered that Baker was willing to put a reputation on the line without meeting him. Yeah, it was cool. I'm a big fan of hers anyway, so that was cool, and that was the thing to begin with. But yeah, we never actually formed a me formally met in person. She had seen some things on Twitter and the GC sales that she liked. Like, that just shows how good of a person she is. She didn't have to do it for me, but she went to the bat, and it literally resulted in some of the best periods of my time in my entire life. So I can't thank her enough for being at the catalyst for that. It's all surreal. That part is also really, really cool. It was originally Christopher Daniels to reach out to me on Twitter and emailing me asked, would you be interested in coming and working a match or two just for us to have a look at you? And I was like, yes, totally 1000%. I'm not like a, I'm not, I'm not like a sit in. I talked to the phone with a representative. We won't be able to pay you because it's illegal. Would you be interested in coming to do it for free? And I'm like, I don't care about the money. I'll do it for free any day. From there, I was like, sweet, let's do this. So, yeah. And then he talked to the founder, apparently, and said this. I met him when we, the first time when I wrestled Ricky Starks on AEW. It's crazy that Tom Gunn is basically the equivalent of Vince McMahon because he's so easy to talk to in the fact that... <laughs> okay. The equivalent? I mean, like, you could say the antithesis of him. I mean, like, he's not insane in the membrane. Uh, let's move on. Because he's so easy to talk to. And the fact that I play soccer at a high level all my life, I've actually played against the... Bullheim Academy, and when I was playing for the My Island of Jersey, we went over and played the sports director of Bullheim. So I'm having these back and forth conversations just spinning football with him, and I'm like talking about transfers that he's made, hopes for the season. He asked me where I played. It's an easy conversation for sure. He's a great human being, and I thank him so much for the opportunity he's given me. So, Ben Carter. I, I, he's been now he's recently actually been given offers apparently from nxt and from wwe nxt and aew i honestly do hope he goes to aew honestly after you know he defeats COVID and all that so being the elite um on a fun shoot question a uh, fun shoot on episode 224 that dropped today on being the elite just kenny omega they showed a new belt, the BTE World Championship. There's a reason why I talked about why I wanted to talk about this. The reason why I wanted to talk about this is because I want it to be an emotional reason. Like when they show it, they do show it. I wanted to show up on Dynamite, and then when the day comes, since the Young Bucks are clearly turning heel, and I see Kenny Omega join them down the road with that, I want to see. I kind of want to see this risky approach where the elite, the heels, since the elite are heels, the three trio, the original OG, actually make a match where they decree that they end the show permanently and that someone else has to do it, but they're ending the being the elite brand show, which would be a risky move, and they publicly grab a hammer, and just start smashing the title on live television, much to the dismay and despair of the wrestling world and the fans seeing the elite fall apart from grace. It would be such an awesome moment because I am a sick, twisted fuck, and I like making people cry. <laughs> Jared Briscoe, meanwhile, comments on WWE release, jokes that he's responsible for the rise of the evil empire. When asked about it, um, he said, I'm okay, he told Tampa Bay Times regarding his release. The way I see it, I earned a break. So, considering what has connected Hulk Hogan to the right people, sold Florida and Georgia Championship Wrestling to WWE and helped them expand. And he also joked saying, yeah, I'm responsible for the rise of the evil empire. I've been around the world and I've gotten to help build WWE into an empire from the ground floor. I'm good. Gerald Briscoe was an agent of the infamous Kennel from Hell match. Pitting Big Boss Man and against Al Snow, we all know how that was. That one was one that was a mess, but I knew it would be, and that's why I took it. I always took the most difficult matches because I felt like my job was safe if it went wrong. I didn't want someone else to get in trouble. So he has more noble integrity than Vince, so we can go with that. But at the same time, he's also considered a suck-up to Vince at that time back then. And, you know, the Stooges, which, you know, forever paints him as a Stooge character, not as a legitimate performer. Or, well, anyone really. Pat Patterson, especially. But, yeah, I was like... He's also been teasing his this major announcement, but so far it's left fans wanting more. 
regarding what's he going to do on Wednesdays. But uh, it would be interesting to see Jared Briscoe be a, bring about more new big stars for AEW if he does go there. But we'll see what his future is. If he's earned a break, he's earned a break. So WWE, as part of the NXT brand build, uh, announced the Capital Wrestling Center and fans being put into pods. So there's been some exclusive reports from regarding this on Wrestling Inc. Wrestling Inc. has learned that the move to the newly renovated Capital Wrestling Center was due to, in part, to the recent renovation desire for live fans to return. Full Sail wasn't going to allow fans, and NXT wanted to proceed with fans, which we, which was reported last week. This is being looked at as a refresh for NXT, a new set with LED borders, and the return of fans with some talent, as well as in the crowd. There has been talk, but no acknowledgement publicly, that AEW continues to beat NXT in the rating. The notion is the fans are what makes NXT unique. Having a fresh start in a new renovated building, Featuring a new set and live fans in attendance will give NXT a rejuvenation for what it once was had before the pandemic. Ah, so it's the pandemic's fault that people watch AEW. Why do you think that? I mean, can't you just admit that people just watch AEW more? Anyways. Wrestling Union was told that the fans will be in pods at the show, which will be similar to the pods used in the Michael Cohen and Jerry Lawler few- Okay, damn it. These are custom built. Each group that arrives will be taken separately from everyone else to their pod prior to the start of the show. The same procedure will be used when ex exiting afterwards. Fans will not in intermingle with any NXT talent. In the weeks and months to come, barring any positive COVID-19 test results, they will increase capacity. So basically, they just want to say, fuck it, afterwards. So, yeah, they want to bring fans back. I, I get that, and they're trying to be more innovative with pods, but um, well, that make things a little bit more awkward for fans being reminded of, oh, uh, yeah, we, we kind of sucked. That this kind of sucks regarding the COVID crisis. So remember when Sami Zayn fought his match in WWE's main roster, and it was against John Cena, and it was an awesome match. And remember when he did his entrance, he popped his his cuff of his shoulder which okay that was right before the match and he just had to work 22 minutes but um he <laughs> this is what he said in a podcast well so the thing is i didn't know what happened at the time because it happened so fast i think it popped down and popped in right and popped down and popped in right away so clearly there was almost some denial that did something just happen or did it just pop in I didn't even know what it was, but it scared me a little bit, and so when my arm went down, it was back in. Everything seemed fine, and if you watch the footage back, I'm kind of moving it to, to see if my head was, if it was in my head or not, and everything seemed fine. Also, another fun thing, nothing to do with the shoulder, but enough fun is that, about that is that it's my debut against John Cena, the biggest star maybe ever in my hometown. I'm getting this amazing hero's welcome before the match, and I put some Vicks Vapo rub under my nose, and it all looks like angulate on my mustache. I a pig to bay after all those years, and it looks like I have the biggest booger right on my nose. I get in the ring, and I'm telling either the ref or Bret Hart, I think my soldier just went out. Brett's already somewhere else, and I'm trying to tell Cena, I think my soldier popped. But he's from across the ring at this point. I feel fine, but I don't know what just happened. We wrestled for about a minute or so, and he gives me a back suplex. When he gives me the back suplex, that's when it's out, and it's not going back in. I'm trying to roll into the apron, and my arm's just dead, so I can't even roll. I think that when I finally do roll, it goes back into place. So then the doctor gets in the ring, and he goes, are you okay? Do you think you can pop it back in? He he goes, well, it is out or is it in? And I said, what? You tell me? I don't know. You have to tell me. Is it out or is it in? I have no idea. He was like, can you move it? I'm moving it. And I said, okay, I'm just going to keep going. Just stand by. Then we went to have it, I don't know, 15 minutes, but it was great. Good. It was good. Great. So it was just a turbulent night emotionally, just such highs and lows, a drain of life and whatnot. And despite the standing ovation and whatnot, yeah. When he finally returned, Sami Zayn encountered Jamie Noble backstage, who was a producer. Noble reacted in a playful way, which hinted to Zayn that he rubbed some people the wrong way during his absence. I am mis So what you just said so what Sami Zayn just confirmed here was Oh, me being injured? Yeah, that pissed people off because I got injured because uh I'm a machine apparently. 
He said this. He, this is what he said on the podcast. I haven't seen him in five months, nor had I recall really communicating with almost anybody in the company at that time. I was walking in the hallway and I saw J- J- Jamie. He actually walks around me and he wanted nothing to do with my and he wanted nothing to do with my immediate range. He walked around and he said, I'm paraphrasing, but he also said along the lines, Oh, stay away from me. You got enough heat. I haven't said a word. I haven't done anything. I come back and I'm already so nuclear that he needs to walk around me. What have I done? And this relates to a 2017 report where Sami Zayn got heat. Where this was, where this report said this. Um, let's see. Apparently, uh, there was backstage heat over Sami right now because I don't know he was stupid, and that the segment was to establish Sami Zayn with Roman Reigns and Shield as a total geek. Just keep digging, digging, keep digging. Digging, digging, dig in the grave. So, yeah, so he confirmed he got heat for getting injured. You know, Vince, here's an idea. How about you just to say you hate Sammy because he exists? Okay, let's be done with that. Let's just say that. You hate a wrestler for living. You hate a wrestler for getting hurt. <sighs> yeah. Ah. And, and like, I'm like, why? Like, Sammy should have realized when he came back, yeah, I'm screwed, aren't I? So, there was something finally interesting. Paige went on Twitter and wrote this out of nowhere. Learned a lot about unionism today. Selena Vega responded with, Hmm, so it seems that that Vince really pissed everyone off, like, royally. Uh, and then I had made a discovery when I was researching this whole stuff, like trying to find some legal precedent to see if they can get out of it, if there's even a way to get out of it, possibly. Uh, um... I don't get why they did that, but it's. Let me find the post. Um, so regarding the whole Twitch account thing, this is what I found uh, on their terms of service. In order to open an account, you will be asked to provide us with certain information, such as an account and name, password. You are solely responsible for remaining the confidentiality and whatnot. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We agree to all the terms of service and who uses the service under your account and password and you are responsible for all activities that occur under your account and password. Please make sure the information you provide to switch upon registration and all at all other times is true, accurate, current, and complete to the best of your knowledge. Unless expressly permitted in writing by Twitch, you may not sell, rent, lease, share, or provide access to your account to anyone else, including without limitation, changing anyone for access to administrative rights to your account. Twitch reserves all available regular rights and remedies to prevent unauthorized use of your Twitch services, including but not limited to technological barriers, IP mapping, and in serious cases, directly contacting your IP provider regarding such unauthorized use. So, technically, while Vince McMahon thinks he's got and everything, also, by extension, he definitely broke the law. So, in a theoretical scenario, Andrew Yang's after him. Now he has Amazon and Twitch breathing down his neck, potentially, if this goes through. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Take this to court. I, I don't I dare Vince to see if he can win this. He thinks he he can beat the government because he beat them the first time, but now it's like now that now it's not just the steroids scandal kind of kind of issue. No, no, no. It's your entire ideology that's now put on the line here. Oh, oh! Looking forward to that. Looking forward to if that court case happens, I will be very monitoring the situation on that. Okay, so we ended on that positive note on that front, but yeah, um, it, yeah, that's it for the uh, for, for the this day of the Monday evenings Neo Reality Collective episode eighteen. This was Neo Reality and Tim. For free like, comment, subscribe, donate, stay tuned for more. Stay safe out there, everyone. Take care, and and as always, peace out.